So how does the Bible refer to the first day of the week? Is it a new Sabbath? Ezekiel 46.1, Thus says the Lord God, The gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut during the six working days, but the Sabbath it will be opened. The first day of the week is called a what? It's a regular working day. Now you may be in a country where you can actually uh, be prosecuted for breaking what they call blue laws. There are some countries where uh, I know a lady, her father was put in jail in Canada because he was out working in his field on Sunday. Uh, there were times where you weren't allowed to work on Sunday. The laws of men. Again, just breezes on over this, makes an assertion. Oh, the first day is only ever referred to as an ordinary, normal working day. We got more appeals to the old creation period prior to the redemption of creation being accomplished, and then he conflates that with the new creation that we're in now. <laughs> this is the problem with the proof text method of interpretation, folks. They think they have an infallible interpreter. They can just consult her. I was just in Judd Lake's book earlier, Ellen White Under Fire, getting ready to do a stream on that. And it, it just it, it blows my mind. It, he just, multiple times in the book, he just admits Yet SDAs will deny this. Well, she's the lens through which the Bible, you know, she she the, as the lesser light, she's the lens that we're to go to the Bible with. And then she helps us really bring out the gems of the Bible. We can really understand it. Yeah, right. She's the infallible interpreter. Well, no. Okay, well, then that's what your Sabbath school quarterly says. So then we'll just appeal to that where it verbatim says the infallible book needs an infallible interpretation in order to arrive at the correct destination. So, but this is how it works. They just cite these verses because that's the approved thing from either the guys at the BRI or and, and they've consulted Ellen White or, or uh, you know what have you. But because that's the case, well then it's just they know it's biblical. When no, they just do these drive-bys and make these assertions. They fail to look at the bigger picture from Genesis to Revelation to see where the narrative is going and what the real substance actually is. The only reason one would think these verses somehow refutes the Christian Sabbath position is if they don't understand it, which Doug clearly doesn't. And I think that's clear at this point. They assume the ceremonial form of the command cannot change, yet it does change. Doug already admitted in part one, days were created. He claimed God created the seventh day on the seventh day. Yet then he cites where Jesus said Sabbath was made, made for man, not angels. They believe it's eternal. They think the seventh day has an eternal aspect to it to where it was being observed prior to the creation of the earth, yet Doug claims the seventh day was created on the seventh day. It's like, do you guys listen to yourselves? Days are dependent upon the sun and moon, which are also a part of creation. Again, all of the other uh, all the other unfallen worlds that they believe in they think they're all uh, observing the 10 commandments so are there like a bunch of parallel timelines with like and it's like the seventh day here but it's this, it could be a different <laughs> just crazy man think about this folks all these other unfallen life forms on all the other worlds they believe in they all observe the Ten Commandments, supposedly. That's why they're unfallen. Which would mean the seventh day wasn't actually created like Doug claimed. Because days were already in existence, even before the creation of the earth. But in their minds, if you say the ceremonial form of the command has changed, you've changed something that's immutable. When no, days are not eternal. That's not the aspect of the command that's eternal. The substance of it is. And the substance of the fourth commandment is that the one true God is due worship, honor, and praise by virtue of who he is. He always has been, always will be worthy of that. That's the eternal aspect, not the seventh day. They've taken the language of others, which is why I get so worked up about this, such as some of the Puritans, the Reformers, and then twisted what those men were saying to try and say, well, the SDA church just believes the same thing those people did. When no, None of them agreed that the seventh day is some eternal, unchanging thing or any of this pre-earth origin story that filters all of SDA theology. The Puritans and Reformers started with Scripture as the starting point, not the great controversy, 
which is then used to interpret all of scripture. But then he cites Ezekiel 46.1, another passage they love. Doug, that verse shows the pattern of the command. Six working days followed by a Sabbath. It doesn't say Saturday. It doesn't say Sunday. He assumes his Roman calendar influence and imports that into the text, failing to see that what's in view is a pattern. And it was based on a memorial. This is also in the old creation. Christian Sabbatarians still follow that same pattern, Doug. The Memorial Day has simply shifted by virtue of Christ accomplishing what the old one was pointing to, such that now in the new creation, we are living in the substance of what the type pointed to, and the order is back to how it was pre-fall. We are back in right relationship with God. We begin our week in communion with him and then go out and subdue the earth through our labors to God's glory the following six days. Repeat. If you recall from part one, they loved, Doug brought this up. The seventh day was around prior to the fall. Yeah, God's seventh day, not man's. (laughs) Man was fashioned and formed on preparation day, and his first day based on evening to evening was the seventh day. You guys missed this. It moved to the end of man's week after the fall because man's rest also became cursed by the curse that was placed on creation. Christ comes and redeems and restores what man lost and puts us back in right relationship with God. And all of that stuff ultimately points to God's rest. We got into all that in part one. He said, what's the first day of the week called? A regular working day. Oh, really? Notice the Feast of Booths in Leviticus 23. The Feast of Booths was named that because it was instituted to remember the wilderness journey from Egypt to Canaan when then when God made them live in, in booths. And before we read this, remember, the Sabbath is rooted in rest, creation, and redemption. Those three things. And we see this unfolding in redemptive history leading to the incarnation and God himself coming who would restore the creation that fell, redeem it, which includes humanity since we are a part of that, and would then enter his rest, God's rest, after that work was completed. So with that in mind, notice Leviticus 23, 33 through 43. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, on the 15th day of this seven month and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day, You shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation. For presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give the Lord. On the 15th day of the seven month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid of splendid trees, branches of palm branches, and boughs of leaf trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. That's what they used to actually build their booths with. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Thus the reading of God's holy word. So the SDA church is wrong when they claim there were two laws, God's law and Moses' law. No, Moses was a mediator, a conduit messenger between God and the people. He was a picture of Christ who is the better mediator than Moses. That's what Hebrews 3 is talking about. But it was all God's law. Nevertheless, Doug, there you go. The first day is said to not only be holy in some instances, but no ordinary work was to be done on the Feast of Booths, which occurred on the first day showing that the holiness aspect around any day is tied to obeying God, not some sort of ethereal divinity 
that a day of a week that the day of a week possesses. They'll dismiss this as simply being a festival, as if that negates the point. It doesn't. This is a type and shadow of the substance, which is Christ. The new covenant creation was anticipated in the Old Testament feast days by the eighth day Sabbath, which pointed figuratively to Christ. We got into that some last time. The new creation, by the way, was also anticipated by the Jubilee year, which was the year after the seventh seven. So again, eight. Christ declared himself to be the fulfillment of the Jubilee in Luke 4, uh, 419, which is why every Sunday is a is the day after the seventh, like a almost like a miniature Jubilee. But also notice, it says this festival is to be a statute forever. Yet SDAs love appealing to places like Ezekiel, which say the same thing about the Sabbath being forever to try and bolster their position. Oh, it's going to be observed in heaven, brother. Isaiah 66. Yet they don't think the Feast of Booths will be observed in eternity. And as you'll see in a moment, they don't, uh, they don't observe the festivals and ceremonial aspects and claim they were nailed to the cross. When no, the festivals are actually kept now by being in Jesus, who's the substance of them. That includes the Feast of Booths. No law was nailed to the cross. But I guess that would mean something that is said to be forever doesn't mean it will always have the same form it once had. In fact, to be consistent with their whole, the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross line, they would have to then recognize that something that is said to be forever can be done away with. Nevertheless, this is a perfect example that no, when the SDA church claims that God never called any other day holy, they are wrong. It's right there, Doug. Redemption out of slavery is exactly what the Feast of Booths is about. The first day, redemption. Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, the second giving of the law, the form of the fourth commandment changing. Are you getting all the connections, folks? No, no, no. They have no biblical, they have no biblical support. No, we're just not on spiritual milk all the time. You got to get past that, folks. You got to get past that. And this idea of the silly standard that they like to whip out. Oh, where, show me one verse in the Bible that says, yeah, okay. That's not going to work out very well when you internally use that same standard because you're not supposed to use unjust weights and measures like the Proverbs say. Redemption out of slavery is exactly what the Feast of Booths is about. This is a foreshadowing of our redemption, which again is one of the three things that the Sabbath is rooted in, creation, redemption, and rest. The, the Israelites were to remember the true God of heaven and earth. That's creation. Remember their redemption that he ultimately led. That's redemption. And they were to rest in doing so. That's the rest. This took place on the first day. It's all right there, sir. You guys love typology, supposedly. There you go. The exodus out of slavery was typological of our bondage and slavery to sin. And Jesus, as the better Joshua and Moses, led us out in a better pro to a better promised land, the heavenly Mount Zion. The better rest by a better mediator, a better Joshua that led a better redemption. We've looked at Hebrews 3 and 4 before many times, which lays all that out. But it's this sort of hopscotching around the Bible in little sound bites that's Doug's problem. You don't actually look at the substance or theme of the narrative of Scripture and the bigger picture of what's going on. So you have to resort to, to conspiracy theories and just ridiculous assertions to try and say we have no, remember last week, we have no rhyme or reason for what we do. We're just like a guard standing post that just inherited a tradition and we have no idea why we're doing what we're doing. This is after he used the hasty generalization fallacy by saying he went to a couple pastors locally that couldn't give him an answer to the subject on the Sabbath. So therefore Christians just have no basis. No, Doug, you just didn't look hard enough. Now he's going to go into full-blown historical revisionism mode. Buckle up.